In 1983, over 700,000 video game cartridges, mostly notably E.T. the Extraterrestrial, were buried in Alamogordo's landfill in New Mexico by Atari Incorporated, an American video game developer and home computer company founded in 1972. On December 30, 2001, the same city made international news when Christ Community Church held a public book burning of books in the Harry Potter series and several other series. Some years earlier, in the Jordana del Muerto Desert, not so far from Alamo Gordo, the first nuclear bomb test took place. This is a fact known to few people, but I'm sure things will change soon, because the new Christopher Nolan film, Oppenheimer, has finally landed, and I can't wait to experience it in the best possible way. Are you planning to do that as well? Let us know in the comments below. Initial impressions of the movie have been overwhelmingly positive, but wait, brace yourselves for a spoiler alert. Some have voiced concerns about a controversial sex scene between Cillian Murphy and Florence Pugh, claiming that it verges on offensiveness and racism. However, if you're a science enthusiast willing to set aside these issues, here's a little something that may enhance your movie-going experience. A glimpse into the fascinating science of Oppenheimer. First of all, for those of you that don't know about it, Oppenheimer tells the story of the scientist who created the first atomic bomb. He was amazingly intelligent as a kid already. When he was only 12, he was using the family typewriter to correspond with a number of well-known geologists about the rock formations he had studied in Central Park. Not aware of his youth, one of these correspondents nominated Robert for membership in the New York Mineralogical Club. And soon thereafter, a letter arrived inviting him to deliver a lecture before the club. Oppenheimer gave the speech and got a round of applause for his efforts, though he needed to stand on a box in order to see over the podium. You could really tell this kid would have gone far. Coming from a German-Jewish family, Oppenheimer was also a really kind and generous person. In 1937, he used his own money to sponsor his aunt and part of her family when they fled their home to come stateside after Hitler rose to power. He was a great scientist, and he was one of the first ones to be interested in cosmic rays, a relatively new phenomenon for their times that had only been discovered in 1912. In 1931, he and a student named Frank Carlson co-wrote the first of many scientific papers about the physics of these rays of particles coming from God knows where in the universe. Nowadays, we know these are electrically charged subatomic particles that crash into our atmosphere, where they are broken up and fall to Earth in even smaller fragments, and we know a lot of them come from supernovae. Not only was he an incredible man of science, he was also deeply fond of poetry. He was actually a poet himself. One of his poems was even published in an issue of the Harvard Literary Magazine, Hound and Horn. He really enjoyed reading, and you can find Baudelaire, Shakespeare, Dante Alighieri, and Plato among the writers that shaped his vocational attitude and philosophy on life. Our three times Nobel Prize nominated guy never had the chance to actually win one but he did get to take home the Enrico Fermi Award in recognition of his especially meritorious contribution to the development, use, or control of atomic energy. Oppenheimer was known for his chain-smoking habit, a habit that would eventually lead to his downfall. In 1965, Oppenheimer received the devastating news that he had throat cancer. Doctors attempted surgery, but it proved inconclusive, leaving Oppenheimer with a grim prognosis. He decided to try radiation treatment and chemotherapy, but these efforts would ultimately prove unsuccessful. As his health deteriorated, Oppenheimer slipped into a coma on February 15, 1967. Just three days later, on February 18th, he passed away at his home in Princeton, New Jersey. He was only 62 years old. A week after his death, a memorial service was held in his honor at Princeton University. The gathering was attended by 600 of Oppenheimer's closest scientific, political, and military colleagues. Among them were notable figures such as Hans Bath, Leslie Groves, George Kennan, and Eugene Wigner. 
After the service, Oppenheimer's body was cremated and his ashes were placed in an urn. His wife Kitty took the urn to St. John and released it into the sea as a final farewell to the man she loved. In the years following his death, Oppenheimer's legacy continued to be recognized and honored. In 1970, a lunar crater was named after him, and on January 4, 2000, an asteroid was also named in his honor. As you can see, the story of Oppenheimer is not just the story of the creation of the first atomic bomb. It is the story of a human, with his flaws and qualities, with his passions and problems. Can't wait to see how the movie will unveil the life of one of the greatest physicists of all time. The Science Behind the Nuclear Bomb Atoms To better understand the movie, you have to know how an atomic bomb works, which in turn requires us to go back to the infinitesimally small atoms. At the heart of an atom lies its nucleus, where protons and neutrons huddle together. Protons are positively charged, neutrons have no charge, and electrons carry a negative charge. With equal numbers of protons and electrons, an atom remains neutral. But here's the twist. Changing the number of protons or neutrons can drastically alter an atom's behavior. Adding or subtracting protons creates a completely different element, while adjusting the number of neutrons results in isotopes. Let's take carbon for example. It has three isotopes. 1. Carbon-12 It boasts six protons and six neutrons, making it a stable and commonly found form of carbon. 2. Carbon-13 With six protons and seven neutrons, it remains stable yet rare. 3. Carbon-14 This isotope has six protons and eight neutrons, making it both rare and unstable or radioactive. While most atomic nuclei are stable, a few are just a bit more rebellious. These unstable nuclei spontaneously release particles, which we call radiation. When a nucleus emits radiation, it becomes radioactive, and this process is known as radioactive decay. There are three types of radioactive decay to consider. 1. Alpha decay The nucleus kicks out an alpha particle, consisting of two protons and two neutrons tightly bound together. Two, beta decay. In this case, a neutron transforms into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. The emitted electron is what we call a beta particle. 3. Spontaneous fission. As the name suggests, the nucleus splits into two pieces, neutrons and gamma rays. A burst of electromagnetic energy may also be released. Pay close attention to spontaneous fission, as it will play a significant role when we explore nuclear bombs. So when we say an atomic nucleus is stable, it means its content doesn't feel the need to change. But when it's unstable, it seeks excitement and emits radiation. This radiation can come in the form of particles or energy bursts. And it's what makes radioactive decay happen. The science behind the nuclear bomb. Nuclear fission. Nuclear bombs are all about the forces that hold atoms together, especially the ones with unstable nuclei. There are two ways the nuclear energy can be unleashed from an atom. The first way is called nuclear fission. It's like splitting an atom right down the middle using a neutron. When this happens, the atom breaks into two smaller parts. This splitting process releases a lot of heat, energy, and radiation. The second way is called nuclear fusion. It's like bringing two smaller atoms closer together until they join and form a larger atom. This process also releases a lot of heat energy and radiation. Nuclear fission was discovered by the Italian scientist Enrico Fermi. In the 1930s, he showed that if you shoot neutrons at certain elements, they can transform into completely different elements. It was like a magical transformation. After Fermi's discovery, other scientists named Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann tried shooting neutrons at uranium. Guess what happened? Uranium split into smaller pieces and released a radioactive substance called barium. This finding made them realize that low-speed neutrons can cause the nucleus of uranium to break apart. But here's the exciting part. When uranium splits, it releases even more neutrons. This got scientists thinking. Could these free neutrons start a chain reaction that releases a massive amount of energy? If so, they could create a super powerful weapon. And that's how the discovery of nuclear fission by Enrico Fermi led to the creation of the first atomic bomb. 
By splitting atoms and causing a chain reaction, scientists were able to release an enormous amount of energy and create a weapon like no other. Where was Robert Oppenheimer when all this was happening? He was busy studying quantum phenomena such as quantum tunneling and energy levels of the multi-electron atoms. He was also involved in radioactivity research, and in 1930, he even predicted the existence of a new particle, the positron. Then in 1942, our buddy was recruited to work on the Manhattan Project, and in 1943 he was appointed director of the project's Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, tasked with developing the first nuclear weapons, four years after the start of the German nuclear weapons program. His leadership and scientific expertise were instrumental in the project's success. On July 16, 1945, he was present at the first test of the atomic bomb, Trinity. In August 1945, the weapons were used against Japan in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which remained the only use of nuclear weapons in an armed conflict. Hey, if you're still watching the video, it means you're really enjoying it. Don't forget to like the video and hit the notification bell so that we can improve our videos for you, the viewer. Vocabulary Calutron In the next few minutes, I'll take you on an adventure to explore some key concepts that will unlock the mysteries behind the movie. Buckle up and prepare to be amazed. Our first stop on this scientific roller coaster is the intriguing realm of the Calutron. Now, you may be wondering, what on earth is a Calutron? Well, my friends, it's a genius device that played a pivotal role in the creation of nuclear bombs. Yep, we're diving deep into the atomic world. Let's start with atoms, those tiny particles that make up everything around us. Take uranium, for example. It's an element with multiple isotopes, the most common being uranium-238. But here's the kicker. To make nuclear bombs, we need a specific isotope known as uranium-235. Now, separating uranium-235 from uranium-238 is like searching for a needle in a haystack. These isotopes have almost identical properties, making them devilishly hard to distinguish. That's where the calutron swoops in. Picture this. You have a box full of marbles, mostly red, uranium-238, and a few blue, uranium-235. Your mission, retrieve only the blue ones. The Calutron acts as your trusty sorting machine, armed with magical powers to detect the tiniest of differences. Here's how it works. First, uranium is transformed into a gas. Then, this gas is pumped into the Calutron, where it encounters electric and magnetic fields. These fields manipulate the paths of the uranium atoms based on their mass. Think of it as a magnetic force gently nudging marbles of different weights in various directions. The lighter blue marbles, uranium-235, are bent more than the heavier red ones, uranium-238. Voila! The isotopes are separated, and the concentrated uranium-235 is now ready for its explosive destiny. During World War II, calutrons were unsung heroes, tirelessly enriching uranium for the first atomic bombs. Without them, the bomb's power would have been insufficient for the devastating impact we witnessed. They paved the way for nuclear technology, revealing the incredible power and weighty responsibility that comes with unraveling the energy trap within atoms. After the war, other methods of enrichment became more common, but calutrons were a crucial first step. They paved the way for nuclear technology and showed us both the incredible power and immense responsibility that comes with harnessing the energy inside atoms. Vocabulary bosons and fermions. There are only two types of fundamental particles known in the entire universe, fermions and bosons. Every particle, in addition to the normal properties you know like mass and electric charge, has an intrinsic amount of angular momentum to it, colloquially known as spin. Particles with spins that come in half-integer multiples are known as fermions. Particles with spins in integer multiples are bosons. There are no other types of particles, fundamental or composite, in the entire known universe. The dramatic difference in behavior between bosons and fermions has led to a sociology of fundamental particles. It has been established that bosons are social and gregarious, while fermions are antisocial and aloof. Vocabulary New Physics 
Perhaps you'll hear the word new physics while watching the movie and you'll wonder what exactly that means. Don't worry, I'm here to make your life easier. New physics is just a term used in the mid to late 20th century to describe the rapid evolution of discoveries in the field of physics. In particular, this movement included the development of quantum mechanics, a field that proved essential to Oppenheimer's pursuit because it enabled researchers to create tools like the Calutron, as well as understand the mechanics of fission and fusion. Vocabulary Mass, Energy, Equivalence Mass energy is the energy associated with a body of a specific mass. Indeed, physics tells us that these two quantities, mass and energy, are equivalent, and they are indissolubly related by the famous equation E equals mc squared discovered by Einstein. The value of the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, and it is therefore a huge number. This means that a small amount of matter can be equated to a very large amount of energy and vice versa. However, the possibility to transform mass into energy only occurs in some special cases. One of these is nuclear fission. Vocabulary Nuclear Fallout When a nuclear bomb goes off or there is a nuclear accident, it releases a ton of crazy energy and sends radioactive particles flying into the sky. These tiny radioactive particles are like the sneaky hitchhikers of the nuclear world. They ride like the wind currents and settle back down to Earth, sometimes far away from where the bomb or accident happened. That's the fallout part. And here's the bummer. These radioactive particles can be dangerous to living things because they emit harmful radiation. They can mess with our cells and cause all sorts of health issues, so definitely not a chill scene. But the good news is scientists and governments are totally on top of this. They study fallout patterns, predict where it might go, and take precautions to keep people safe. So while nuclear fallout isn't a rad thing, we're doing our best to handle it responsibly and protect everyone from its not-so-cool effects. The life of Robert Oppenheimer was truly remarkable. Not only was he a brilliant physicist who played a crucial role in the development of the atomic bomb, but he was also a multifaceted individual with a deep appreciation for literature and poetry. His contributions to the field of science, from his early work on cosmic rays to his leadership in the Manhattan Project, were nothing short of extraordinary. However, Oppenheimer's story is not without its tragic elements. His chain-smoking habit led to his untimely death from throat cancer at the age of 62. It is a reminder that even the brightest minds are not immune to the consequences of their actions. Despite the controversy surrounding his involvement in the creation of the atomic bomb, Oppenheimer's legacy continues to be honored. From lunar craters to asteroids named after him, his name lives on in the annals of scientific history. As we wait to experience the movie about his life, it is clear that he was not just a scientist, but a complex human being with flaws and virtues alike. His story serves us as a reminder that even the most brilliant minds are not devoid of humanity. That's all for this video. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the life and science of Oppenheimer. We hope you found it fascinating and thought-provoking. Have you already seen the movie? What do you think about it? Let us know in the comments below.